Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Evan Caldwell. I'm just a superintendent, Deborah Rumbaugh. We are going to chat about our upcoming levy, um, answer some of your questions. Feel free to type any questions into the Facebook or Instagram chat, and we, our moderator will give them to us. Um, we've been out and about in the community, talking to lots of people and getting a lot of feedback about our upcoming levy and making sure that they're fully informed and have all the facts and information they have to make an informed decision. So I just want to kind of start with what has surprised you the most during this process of getting out and about into the community? One of the biggest surprises, Evan, I think, is helping our community and our staff understand the definition of basic education. We, A lot of us have heard that the state fully funds basic education, but understanding what that definition means for us is really important. And loosely speaking, the definition for basic education is what happens for kids from the starting bell to the ending bell. Things that happen before and after the day and ancillary to the school day typically don't fall within that definition of basic education. And so that really requires us to think about how do we provide those experiences for kids. Yes, yeah, uh, parents and staff and families have been kind of surprised to learn that their own definition of what they consider to be basic education for a school is different from what the state is considered. So I mean, how, walk me through how kind of the state Process. Absolutely. So the state uses what they call a prototypical model, and it's a mathematical model to determine what it is in the state's view that they need to be able to run our schools. And so that mathemat mathematical model is used across the state for every district, and it takes into consideration a district's enrollment and a couple of other factors, and then that really just sort of spits out dollars that the state sends to schools and it falls within that, that definition of basic education. It doesn't take into consideration what specific communities need in their schools, and do you mind if I give you an example? Sure, yeah, let's do it. So I think about nursing. Mm -hmm. um, the state, using the prototypical model, says that Stanford Camino School District is entitled for funding for 4.3 nurses. Mm -hmm. And the students that we have in our system, the medical needs that we have, and just to fund, nurses across our schools, we require over nine nurses. And so we pay for five and a half of those nurses out of our money funds. Yeah, people seem to be kind of surprised when they mm -hmm. see that type of information. Um, the state's definition of funding safety and security also seems to surprise some people. Very surprising, yes. So using that same model, that mathematical model that the state uses, they fund us for 0.8 of one position for safety, so that's less than one person. And it's surprising knowing what happens weekly or monthly across our country in schools. And to ensure that our students are safe, we employ 9.2 individuals. That includes our SRO, we have another safety person at the high school, and then really a whole crew of folks that help get our kids across streets safely, point A to point B, and that's upwards of nine individuals. And so significant difference between less than one and, and nine and a half that we need. So that's where the levy really saves the day for us. Yeah. So this this levy, you know, how what big of a piece of pie of our, our budget is here for this levy? It's our second greatest source of revenue, and it comes in at about 16% of all of our general funds. So that's a big chunk. Big chunk. It's a little bit different than our tech levy. Absolutely, yes. That so um, Yep, yeah. yep. Um, our tech levy, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, different levy. It was an ask of the community for uh, the ability to maintain our properties and help our technology infrastructure be maintained. So setting that aside, uh, we were required to absorb some of those costs through a general fund. And this levy is the big levy that, again, bridges that gap between the state's prototypical model and the actual costs mm -hmm. to run our schools. And you know, this, uh, this levy is expiring in February, and so our ask of the community is to renew that levy different from the tech levy last year. Good. Yeah, well, uh, another thing going out talking to people in the community that's been kind of fun is that we get to look into how school levies are taxed and how they're different from state property tax funding. So that's been eye-opening to me, I know, and I know to many other people, uh, some of our staff members too, and so glad to know how this works. Mm -hmm. So explain kind of how those two things are different. 
Yeah, it's been fun to kind of talk with our staff and community about that. So we know that we have property taxes, and when our property values go up, our property taxes go up. So if we were to set that aside and think about levies, interestingly, levies do the opposite of that. So when property taxes go up, the amount or the rate that we contribute to the levy goes down. And the, the simplest reason for that is when property values go up, there really are more people at the table to contribute to the levy, and so we all contribute a little bit less. It, it's been kind of interesting mm -hmm. that people, you know, it, but you understand, nobody's sitting at home learning how their taxes work on their time off, so mm -hmm. we get it. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that uh, we've had several questions for that is that they're, you know, pro being for school levies, mm -hmm. but they don't want to pay an extra tax. So, is this an extra tax? Common question. So, not an extra tax, not a new tax, not an additional tax. Mm -hmm. So, we currently have a four-year levy that will be um, expiring at the uh, end of this term, and so we are asking voters to simply renew that same. Uh, we expect that to be the same rate and renew that levy for us for another four years. Another thing that's been fun to share is that this levy has been continuously approved in some form or fashion since 1964. Mm -hmm. And so to have a 60-year tradition of these funds for our students and our staff and our programs is, I think, something our community should be really proud of. And it's not unique, right? I mean, this is a funding model that's throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and I, I find it really interesting to talk about kind of where we rank among the state and our county and our tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, 189th out of the 295 school districts in the state and number 14 in Snohomish County. Yep, we are the third from the bottom. We're number 11. Yep. Um, so we use that money, again, you said to fill gaps in underfunded um, uh, positions and programs. So can you speak more about what some of those examples are that people might be asking about? Yeah, definitely. So we like to think of levy dollars as funding positions, programs, and the people that run those programs. And so we spend about 60% of levy dollars to supplement our general education programs. Because like we talked about with nurses and safety, the same thing happens with teachers in terms of the state prototypical model does not take into consideration courses, whether they be electives, you know, choir, or you know, maybe some academic courses that we want to run, or let's say we want to keep certain class, certain grade levels at the elementary level. And so that helps us be able to hire the teachers necessary to do that. Similarly, uh, we like to have enough paraeducators to support teachers in the classroom. That also comes from levy dollars. And on the special education side, it's very similar. And so the state uh, really underfunds special education by a significant amount, and so we utilize levy dollars to be sure that, that special education programs and students and staff have what they need to be successful as well. There's one other, if I can share. Sure. Um, interesting piece of the definition of basic education is that, you know, in that, that definition we described, we do receive funding from the state to purchase food for meals, and we receive funding to prepare meals. Um, however, the serving of those meals is not included in that definition of basic education. And so, again, that's where the levy comes in for us to be able to have the people to be able to provide meals for, for students. Definitely one of those, another one of those things that surprised Surprising. people along the way. Um, one of the other questions we're getting is why are we running a levy now? Right. So in, it'll be on the February 13th ballot, but people kind of assume that elections are in November mm -hmm. or in the summer, so yeah. why February? Yeah, common question. So our budget cycle requires that um, about this time of year, late winter, early spring, we are budgeting for the next year. And so if a school district doesn't run a levy in the winter, spring time, we don't know if we have funds avail available or not, and it makes it really impossible for us to create a balanced budget if we don't know about that 16%. So if we were to wait, let's say, and run that levy in August or November, we would have to assume that those funds would not be available. Uh, you know, that just would be the fiscally responsible thing to do. So that would push us to have to make significant reductions to staffing and programs. And to do that and then possibly pass a levy is just a really difficult thing for you know, employees, kids, and families to navigate. So 
a levy in the spring or the winter just lets us know what our financial outlook is as we go into budget season. And we're not alone. It seems like every other school is doing the same thing. Yes. Yes. Arlington's on the ballot, Lakewood's on the ballot, one other one. So um, you talked about budget reductions. Mm -hmm. what, so walk us through what happens if a levy like this fails. Mm -hmm. So we engage the community in helping us prioritize what is eliminated or reduced. And it's important to know the community's wishes in that. And everything really is on the table. And so we have to take a hard look at things that we love and care very much about because those things could eventually go away. And you know, sadly, there's a neighboring district here in Seville that is in that position right now. And you know, they're having to take a serious look at do they have athletics at all in any of their schools? Are they able to have librarians and school counselors? And so we just really want to avoid being in that scenario and want to you know, just ensure that our community doesn't have to navigate that. Yeah. So we explain that to people sometimes, mm -hmm. and we still get the question, yes, but will the thing that I care most about be cut? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. And, you know, what we don't have is a list that says we're going to cut X, Y, Z, and that is because we want to engage the community in that process. And interestingly, we've begun those community meetings already, mm -hmm. and helping the community think of, help us think about what their priorities are when we have to make, and if we were to have to make hard decisions about that. And good. it really could be anything. It, it, it could be across the board, and I think it, it would have to touch every school, right? Absolutely. And with 16% mm -hmm. of your budget, it's hard to mm -hmm. miss a part of it. Yeah. yeah, and you know, we can't say, uh, we didn't pass a levy, so there's no kindergarten. Uh, or, you know, we're only gonna school kids through, 12, through 11th grade. And so that, decrease in people and, and programs that would have to really spread across all of our schools. Um, the implications are just in school, though, mm -hmm. if you felt throughout the community. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are the largest employer in the community. We employ just under a thousand individuals. Um, and we are unique in the sense that our the folks that we employ are also our community members. And that is unique to Stanwood. That's not the case in most communities. And so being the largest employer, knowing that in, without a levy we would have to cut positions and reduce or maybe eliminate programs, that really does impact our employment pool. Yeah. Well, um, as we've been out and about and talking with lots of people in the community, what are some like, aha moments you've had out there explaining how levies work mm -hmm. to people? Yeah, uh, some of the biggest aha moments have just been helping folks with conversations around assessed value, that, that concept of when your property values go up, the amount of the levy that you contribute, the rate you contribute goes down. That's been a big aha. I think we just naturally associate levies to be the same as property taxes, when in fact, we do the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, the other aha is just hearing people's surprise around things like, we are allocated for less than one person for safety, knowing you know, what happens in schools. And hearing our community members and our staff say, you know, I'm glad that I know that because that gives me information when I when I make my vote. And I think as a superintendent, I would really not want to have a situation where somebody were to say, if I had known, mm -hmm. if I had only known the implications on athletics and safety and, and other things that might have played into my decision one way or another, that's been a really, really important aha for us. And, creates a burden that we get information off. Yeah. Well, and for, for me, I've experienced a lot of people that have, uh, didn't have a desire just to rubber stamp something, mm -hmm. they really wanted to dig in and know. And so when we gave them all this information, they were very excited to have all the facts so that they can make their own decision. Mm -hmm. And so that's been fun to see. Yeah, and uh, the community has been so receptive to that. And we really tried, I think, to have this be an education campaign as much as anything. And I think it's been really well received and, and um, look forward to continuing. Yeah, and uh, people sharing the information with other people when they know that this is even on the ballot is going to be very helpful in sharing that information out with as many people as we can. Yeah. Have there been any questions so far, moderator? No. You know, one, thing, okay. we, one thing we didn't talk about, Evan, was the difference between rate and the total amount that voters approve. Mm -hmm. on the ballot. So voters are not approving a rate. They're not approving a dollar forty two per thousand dollars of assessed value or a dollar twenty eight. What they're approving is a fixed amount. And so if we think about 
um, the voters approving, let's say, at 15.4 million, that is sort of like the fulcrum on a teeter-totter, mm -hmm. and that remains fixed. And so it doesn't matter what happens to property values, good, bad, or otherwise, that doesn't change. If we layer assessed values on top of that, as assessed values go up, the voters pay less, and then this, the reverse happens if and when property values settle. And that's been an aha, too, that okay. this idea that if my property values go up, surely you're going to be collecting more. Yeah. But it's capped, mm -hmm. and you can't get and more. Um, and you know, oftentimes it's less. it's less than that for several reasons. Um, uh, the other thing was the senior exemptions. Yes. Let's take a quick moment to talk about yeah. how that's an option for people. Yes, that's also been an aha. Mm -hmm. um, so both Snohomish and Island County have an opportunity for uh, disabled adults or senior citizens, and I think we're defining that per the county as 61 years old. Yeah. Um, they can petition the assessor's office in a very simple and easy process with their most recent tax return to be exempt from the tax. And starting in January, in Island County, the income cap for that is $54,000 annually, mm -hmm. and in Snohomish County, it's about $74,000. Yeah. So we know that if an individual roughly has an income of about $100,000, they're 61 or over, or a disabled adult, the exemptions, the deductions yeah. that the counties provide get them right about to that point. And it, it's surprising how few individuals um, take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great opportunity for those on a fixed income to have that tax burden removed and be able to make uh, the choice that they want on the ballot. And, and it's, it's a, the threshold has increased in a bunch because of the state legislature making a change in, uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So that's been a good reason for people to kind of dive back into it and see if you qualify it this upcoming year. Yeah. And I think we've talked before about um, in Island County, only about 800 individuals have taken advantage of that opportunity. And so, you know, the numbers are different in Snohomish County, but really something to keep in mind. Yeah, the assessors think a lot more people can qualify for that. Um, I think that's it for what I have for you, but I would just encourage everyone to ask us any questions and check out our levy website and send us any other in questions or concerns. Have a good night. Thanks everyone.